next talk, uh, it's extracting programmable logic with photons by John McMaster. I would let him talk and explain more about his uh, title, but uh, let me quick do a quick introduction to him. Uh, John is a hardware security expert based out of Santa Clara, the home of Hardware.io USA edition. Uh, I normally like to introduce John about his hobbies and not about his work because uh, he does that on Twitter a lot. Uh, but uh, let me give you guys some more insights uh, on John. Uh, he has an army of bomb disposable robots and voicing your concerns as they grow in the number and, and strength. Uh, John, you may want to show them at the end uh, or whenever. Uh, one of them also has an electrical connection to a shotgun. I do not know why you have that, but okay. Um, another fun fact about John, he was part of launching a satellite uh, in uh, Sri Hari Kota, which he signed it with a special marker in the clean room before launch. I do not know what you were doing in the clean room, John, but one day somebody will find it out. <laughs> All right, John, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and I think you can start your presentation. Sure thing. Well, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, bomb disposal robots, they're growing in number and uh, hopefully uh, I'll get to do a presentation at some point before they take over the world on those. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let me get a screen share up here and uh, hopefully you can see this. And I'm gonna go to presenter view and uh, hello and welcome. Uh, just please confirm you can hear me, you can see the screen. And if all Absolutely. of this sounds good, great. Well, thank you very much. Let's get started then. All right, so uh, I gave a talk a few years ago talking about how uh, when computer chips operate, you know, ICs, they give off some infrared emissions as the circuit is operating. And basically these are at around 1100 nanometers. And the cool thing is these are related to how much current is flowing through the chip. And so if you activate some circuitry, for example, that is related to an ADC, you can actually uh, optically see the ADC lighting up on the chip. And this can be used to actually figure out how the circuits work to some degree. And I explored this, uh, in the previous talk by taking a relatively low cost camera. This camera was about $500 on AliExpress and it's called a back illuminated CMOS camera. And I made some very small tweaks to it to work a little bit better for this purpose. Uh, notably, most cameras have something called an IR blocking filter that is infrared light blocking filter uh, because you know 1100 nanometers is kind of the wavelength that's that's kind of uh, called short wave infrared roughly and most cameras uh, will actually filter out the light from this intentionally because mostly you want to see what your eyeballs can see you know not what silicon happens to be good at seeing so they'll block this out with an IR block filter but I wanted to see that so I removed the original filter and instead installed that black filter at the right which is called an IR pass filter and that looks opaque to you you, you know you can't really see through it but that filter can see in this kind of 1100 nanometer range that I want to see. And that allows me to take things out like, you know, light going through, you know, the windows in the room or, you know, overhead, how, uh, you know, fluorescent lights, you know, kind of stuff like that. I'm able to just narrow down to just the signals that I want to see from the chip, which is really important because not a lot of light comes off the chip as you're doing this. So you really need to, to narrow down to just the right signals if you actually want to get above the noise floor. Okay, with that in mind, um, I guess I'll also add real quick that this is an example of what was in the previous talk. And uh, so here's an example where I was uh, giving external inputs to this chip uh, via some logic pins, and I was observing how the emissions changed on the chip. Uh, so for example, you can see that uh, we had two inputs, input one and input two. And uh, as I had both of them low or one of them low, it had one specific logic state. But as soon as I put both inputs high, uh, the, the logic states changed. And that kind of indicates like an AND gate type relationship, uh, or in this case, uh, a two input and AND gate. And if you want some more details on exactly how that worked, uh, I refer you to the previous talk but just wanted to give a little bit of background here about some of the concepts I was playing with before. Okay, with that in mind, 
Um, you know, this was kind of a little bit interesting to me, you know, it was, it was a little bit toy to see, especially what I could push in the hobbyist space, but it was still a little bit theoretical, a little bit abstract. I was dealing with, you know, kind of these little puzzles of logic. It felt more like a Sudoku than, you know, trying to, trying to like crack the Enigma code. And so there was a question of like, hey, this is a fun toy, but, you know, are there some more kind of fun real world applications of this? And another thing that also came to mind is the, the obvious choice for a lot of people that deal with this sort of uh, kind of like side channel analysis, you know, where you're, you're, you're operating a system and you're looking to see what other signals might be given off by it. A lot of people's default answer is cryptography. And, and in fact, there's a lot that you can do with this. Uh, if you start looking at S boxes, for example, uh, on a, a chip, you know, there's a lot of people like uh, NIDOS, for example, I think did some great papers on that, you know, where, where he's correlating uh, these emissions, and you can crap, crack a cryptographic system based off of that. But I wanted to see if I could do something a little bit different. And here is uh, where we enter a project that I was working on and thinking about different ways that I could solve it. So let's talk about what that project is, and then we'll circle around to how you know, the overarching talk theme fits in. This is something called a TrackStar 128, which is a crazy peripheral to me. It basically is like, hey, you bought a PC, but you wish you had an Apple II? Well, I've got news for you. Just stick this card in your PC and now you've got an Apple II. I don't know how that works out from a licensing perspective. I don't know if everyone, everyone was suing everyone when this type of stuff happened, but lo and behold, this was something on the, the, the market you could buy and you get an Apple II, even though you had a PC and uh, kind of nifty little device. And people have fond memories of this device. And some people just for fun, you know, they wanted to understand how it works. And the good news is a lot of it is just in these, uh, these EEPROMs on there, these, you know, that have the firmware, you know, that, that run on, I guess, some microcontrollers on there. I haven't looked at that bit as carefully. Uh, but the problem is there's a lot of programmable logic on this as well. So if you want to understand kind of how all the signals routed together to, to tie this into one big unified device, you also need to understand what are in those logic chips. Unfortunately, those logic chips were protected so that you couldn't get the data out of them directly. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna show then is three different ways to get the data out of those chips, uh, just to show a lot of different ways that you can approach a problem. Okay. Let's start with a little background on these. As everyone who's ever talked to me knows, I basically decap everything that comes my way. You know, one time Joe Grand came over for a picnic, basically with his family. And it, I think his wife was afraid that I was going to like decap his kids or something like that. Cause you know, she, she like made him like scout the property before they were released to like make sure everything was safe. But anyways, uh, here is uh, here's one of these programmable logic chips on the, uh, on the uh, the PAL, uh, sorry, the TrackStar. Uh, there's the PAL 16R8, which is going to be the focus of this talk, uh, and this is a so-called registered logic device, and that means that you have some logic signals that come into this device. It goes through like some AND and OR gates. They're kind of programmable in a similar way that you might have an FPJ that is programmable, but this is like a much simpler version. And then they go to some output registers, which are directly connected to the outputs. They also have a so-called PAL16L8 instead of R, and that one doesn't have the registers. So it's very simple, you know, input signal in, output signal out, and not a lot of state in between. And uh, let me just check something real quick. Um, and just for reference, there are seven of the PAL 16L8 and one of the PAL 16R8, uh, just if you're curious. And I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer here. I hope you can, because uh, that will be useful later. But uh, there is the center area here, which has basically the actual logic uh, with the fuses that get programmed into this part. And uh, let's talk about that um, a little bit more now. And what are some of the options for getting the programmed fuses out of this part? The first thing is, and the most simple, and this is what basically is the de facto standard today. You know, if, for example, on these L parts, which are just simple inputs, there's a lookup table and there's an output. If you just enumerate all of the different inputs, you're going to get all of the outputs. There's no state. Uh, it's very easy to, to just brute force all the inputs, get all the outputs, and then you can make an equivalent device. 
you're not going to get the original programming file. <clears throat> Sometimes there's uh, you know equivalent logic that you can do, um, but uh, you'll get something that's functionally equivalent. And for a lot of people, that's good enough. And the device on the left, for example, uh, which is called ReadPal, is is a really great project for doing this. And what this does is it converts the pinout basically of these devices to a more conventional EEPROM pinout, which basically any device programmer is going to support. And this means that for very minimal, simple hardware that you can easily breadboard up and some very easily accessible off-the-shelf hardware, you're going to be able to do this brute force readout on one of these devices trivially. Um, an upgrade to this, uh, a good example though, is the DuPel project, which you can see the PCB at the right. And the innovation on this project is there are these registers inside this device. And although you can get the state of the registers because uh, they're directly connected to the output pin, if you want to get all of the states of the device, you need to iteratively go through all of the states and get all of the input permutations that generate all of the output permutations for every known register state. And so what DuPal does is it starts with the entry state uh, and says, hey, could I flip any registers? And if it does, it kind of remembers how to get to those registered states and iteratively figures out every possible state that the device can go in. Really cool, but the complexity of the PCB on the right is an order of magnitude more complex than the PCB on the left. And so uh, one thing that I played with a little bit, just as an aside, was I also took the TL866 programmer, which is very popular, and I maintain some open source firmware for, and I created open, uh, uh, sorry, there's open TL866, which is the open source firmware. And then there was a modification called PAL866, was, which was basically a port of DuPal to the TL866. And the idea was that you tried to get the, the best of both worlds, where it was off the shelf hardware that could also run this more complex uh, algorithm. And that may be a talk uh, that I'll give in the future, um, because that's still a little bit of a work in progress. Anyway. The problem with all these methods though, is that you get equivalent firmware, not the original. And part of this kind of preservation effort, people were also really interested of, hey, can you actually get the exact original firmware? So these are 100% you know, replacement parts, no question about it. And that gave me some motivation to dig a little bit deeper. And uh, as some of you may know, I like to do a lot with mask ROMs. I've done a few talks of them on the past. And there was a question, are these fuses that you physically burn on a part? You know, just like an electrical fuse, you, you pass some current through it, uh, the, the metal blows out. Could you see that under a microscope? You know, if it's, it's making a physical change, you should be able to. And lo and behold, if you look below, you can see that I have eight fuses there. Those are those little, um, you know, hourglass shaped areas. The upper left one has been burned and the lower right one has been burned, but the other six there are still intact. So we don't exactly know from this image what is a one and what is a zero, but by just looking at a blank part, for example, we can even figure out, you know, oh, you know, all zeros is a blank part. So, you know, if we have that shiny hourglass fuse there, that's a zero. Great. So, so we know that we can see the fuses, but how do we figure out where each individual fuse is located on the die? And um, one nice thing about this as well is there is a lot of existing tooling out there. So uh, for example, there's a tool called ROMPAR that's able to do some computer vision on memory layouts like this. And it should be able to, without someone you know, typing on a keyboard, 101010, uh, convert this into what I call a bit matrix, which is like a text file that says 01010. And uh, so we can also work a lot of this into our existing workflows, even though I haven't seen a lot of people specifically uh, reading out fuses under microscopes. But I digress. Uh, let's go back to this bigger problem is how do we know what the memory layout for this is? Uh, because if we had, say, a microcontroller, we might be able to make some guesses by disassembling some firmware repeatedly. And uh, maybe at some point, you know, the disassembly made sense and we go, oh, you know, that's a valid main function. Great, we're, we're done. But when it's logic, it's a little bit more complicated. You know, maybe uh, maybe we form an invalid logic circuit. So we say, okay, this isn't right, but it's a little bit more abstract. It's a little more generic. It's a little bit hard to figure out. And this is where I started thinking back to some of the work I had done previously with the, uh, the chip emissions work. And I said, hey, you know something? 
I bet, even though I can't see it, I bet a lot of light gets put off when you blow these fuses. You know, either they're heating up, maybe there's a spark, something like that. And sure enough, I took uh, some exposures while blowing some fuses under that emissions microscope from earlier, the one that I'm able to capture the infrared light on a chip. And here's an example where I blew uh, three fuses out of four in this area. And you can see those little explosions on the left have been captured and resulted in the, uh, the, the layout at the right, where we see three blown fuses now and one unblown fuse. So great. This is a proof of concept. Uh, if I'm able to see a fuse, why not blow one fuse at a time, uh, take like a time lapse, so like blow one fuse, take a picture, blow one fuse, take a picture. And if I do this enough, it should give me enough information to very quickly figure out the entire memory layout of the device. Because I have basically literally a picture that says, oh, this fuse is here. Uh, okay, let's take a look at what that would look like. Um, the biggest problem with this though is there's a lot of like very proprietary software that I'm using to like program this, uh, you know, kind of weird camera stuff. I needed a way to, to tie all of this together from the automation side. And what I decided to do with that was use something called Auto Hotkey, which is like the best worst programming language out there in that it does some really amazing things. It's just that you, uh, when you use it, you're like, oh man, I wish version two would come out. And they were working on version two, but for some reason it never got released. Um, so, you know, such it goes. But uh, I was able to get things working and I was able to write basically the minimum amount of auto hotkey code that would drive the, pro the proprietary programming GUI. And uh, I was able to basically control that over a socket from some Python code. And this allowed me to coordinate at the end of the day, allowed me to coordinate some Python code that was burning fuses in the chip, one fuse at a time. And then there was a camera that was taking pictures and I could correlate the pictures uh, to the, the fuse burning. So at the end of the day, I got some directories that basically said, hey, here's an image of this fuse burning. Here's an image of this fuse burning. And under the hood, this was all pretty janky, but it, it seemed to work out in the end. Um, here's kind of what this looks like. This is another project because you an idea. You can see like literally a script is like typing keys and like toggling the mouse and stuff like that. But um, yeah, kind of, kind of fun to watch. Your, your computer looks a little possessed, but it uh, gets the job done. All right, oops, let's see if we can get to the next slide here. All right, let's, uh, let's actually see then what was the collected data like? And what I'm gonna show you here is I thought the best way to do this was basically to burn two fuses from the current word and then one fuse from the previous word. And what that allowed you to do was very easily see where are we at now and where, where were we at previously so you could very easily visually see how we're progressing through the memory layout on the device. So let's check this out. So you see we start at the right, we kind of sweep right and left. And this is a, very, this is a relatively similar layout pattern that we've seen in other sort of mask ROM parts. Uh, just decoders uh, just kind of happen to work out like this. I'll show this, show this one more time. So this is great. So with this data now, what I do is uh, I know that like, hey, word zero starts at the right. It, it does this kind of sweeping, you know, right, left, left, right pattern. And I can take this and put this order into a Python script to, to take this uh, so-called 2D bit matrix and, uh, and get the memory layout from that. The second part though, is this is inter word. So that is, we know each like, you know, word zero is at the right and then, you know, word one's next to it. Uh, so we know where the, the words entirely are, but we also need to know the order within a word. So we're just going to repeat this process and just bit blow one bit within a word at a time. This order is a lot more complicated. I don't know why this one skips around so much. Uh, I don't know if this is some sort of logic optimization or just weird uh, data formats that uh, the tools have to deal with. But alas, this is something I can put pretty easily into a lookup table. And so now we have the full memory layout at this point. Great. Okay, moving on. Um, at this point, we have a lot of data that theoretically, if we were to capture it from this microscope, convert it, we have a script that would convert it into a programming file. Um, but I also wanted a way to know if the output firmware was valid. And the way that I was approaching that 
uh, was to take this, this, uh, this PAL adapter that we had earlier um, and use that to basically create some uh, test waveforms from it because we're, we're basically sweeping a bunch of inputs. We get some outputs and uh, basically generate some Verilog test benches. And if everything matches up there, we know we've extracted everything correctly. Uh, so here's kind of the steps that I'm discussing here and uh, just kind of summary. So collect test vectors using that adapter, decap a part so you can see the bits, photograph them, convert the photographs into more of an abstract digital representation, then uh, use the Python scripts that I made to convert them into uh, JED is like a standard programming format. Uh, MAME, for example, ha then has some tools to convert these JED files into Verilog. And then in theory, I could simulate the Verilog with the test vectors from earlier, except there's a problem. I threw all this together and nothing really lined up. I did some debugging. I think the issue is with step six and I was trying to get some help to solve some of the issues there. Um, and I'd like to go back to this at some point, but in parallel to this, I was working another angle and I got this other angle to work. Remember, I said I was gonna try this three ways. We've done this two ways so far. We, we used it, the brute force extraction. Now we've uh, photographed it and extracted it. Um, but there's another technique that if we already decapped the chip, we can go a bit further. So this kind of got pushed by the side, although this was, also, was still very interesting. And I started thinking more, if we can use this microscope to locate fuses, why bother with the data fuses when we can just locate the security fuses? Uh, because if I have the security fuses, in theory, I can microprobe in there and actually just force the chip unprotected directly. And then we don't have to do any of this microscope, you know, photograph, none of this hand conversion, none of this Python script. We just put a little bitty needle on just the right part of the chip. And it just said, oh, we'll read out all the data you want. And at that point, you know, it's just simple, easy, you know, life is good. Uh, and we move on. Uh, so let's give this a try. And so I had a camera view kind of like this on the infrared microscope. And I said, let's take a picture. Let's burn the security fuses. And I should be like basically there. But I did that and nothing showed up. I th so I thought, well, maybe they knew that someone was going to try to do this probing. Maybe they hid the fuses. Like if you put a, a metal layer over these fuses, maybe you wouldn't see them. So I, I looked around the chip a little bit. I was trying to figure out if they were hidden. I didn't see anything. I looked even a little bit more outside of this area. Um, but then I was looking through documentation. I found this data sheet and had this very interesting note. It basically said, it had this ESD caution note and it said that pins are directly connected to the security fuses. And I said, wow, you know, the fuses aren't in that main logic area that I thought they were. They're probably in the broader area of the chip. So let's try taking a picture again of the security fuses burning under this infrared microscope, but let's zoom out so we can see the entire chip. And then I bet they're gonna show up. And I did that and lo and behold, so here's the left that's under the infrared microscope in kind of a, a test mode so I can see the chip. And then I darkened it and I took a picture on the right with the security fuses blowing. And yeah, you can see there's two very bright areas and those are the security fuses, great. So the theory is sound, it's just that I wasn't looking at the right part of the chip. I'll also point out, you can see a few other lit up areas of the chip, but these are just like bias voltages and kind of stuff like that. Some of the analog parts of the chip, they're not security related. We only care about the two very strong signals at the bottom. Great. Um, the next thing I thought is, okay, now that we know where the security fuse is, I wonder if I burned it under the microscope, we actually could just see it blowing you know, just under your average day uh, metallurgical microscope. It's really tiny, but it's, it's this area right here. So I'm gonna play this video, maybe I'll play it twice. Just keep an eye there and you should see the security fuse blowing. Uh, so we'll do this once and boop, you see it went black. And so that was the security fuse. So that's, that's kind of fun. Okay, and here's a close up of it now. You can see uh, just for, for curiosity, that little area there. And we're going to focus on this now. And can we microprobe that security fuse then to, to just directly extract this part using the normal programming interface? And uh, basically, the way that this works is we're first going to use something called a laser probe station, which has a very high power laser. It shoots a massive laser blast at a chip, and it imparts so much energy 
then it blows off some of the protective uh, glass on the top of the chip and exposes the metal below. And if you provide just the right amount of energy, it'll blow out the glass without destroying all of the chip below. So it's a very fine hammer that you have to, you have to get some practice to learn how to do it. But once we've got some holes in the top of the chip, we can take some little tiny needles in there and force uh, the values to deprotect it. Um, I thought that maybe the best thing to do after getting some holes in there, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, would be to uh, basically uh, put an oscilloscope on there to, to just collect a little more data before I start probing around too much. And uh, yeah, I just used some Agilent oscilloscope that I had. And um, the hope is that we would see that these were just at you know either like five volts and zero volts, you know something simple that I could feed in with an external power supply, but the oscilloscope would confirm this. And um, some people talk about using like active probes and all this really expensive stuff. My thought was this chip's pretty old, the transistors are pretty big, uh, there's a lot of power flowing through things. I just basically hooked up banana plugs to the oscilloscope, nothing fancy, but I'm once again to emphasize, I'm probing not on a circuit board, but the actual traces on the IC. Okay, and uh, this is my favorite part. So this is like wrath of God for like, you know, little chips. So that's basically the targeting uh, laser that's uh, on this chip right now. And we're gonna blow a hole in that section so we can, uh, you know, probe into it. And if we wait a second, uh, it should go, boom. And so you see that suddenly it had this transition. We've just knocked a hole in there. So. So now you can see this area looks a little shinier than it was before. And that's because we've taken the, the, uh, the protective glass that was over it. And now we have bare exposed metal that we can stick a needle in. So great. All right, next slide. And this is kind of what this looks like. Uh, because we have two sides of the fuse, I set up two micro positioners. And you can see that they're basically these little knobs here allow you to move on say like the Z axis here, X and Y here. And then you can't see it, but there's little itty bitty tiny needles over here. Uh, the laser is on top of here. It's a little bit out of field of view. And uh, the chip has been secured uh, for viewing under the microscope here with a few test signals coming out over here. So here's another view of it. Uh, for the first shot, I think I was just powering it up to make sure everything worked. But to actually run the programmer through it, which is this little big, big thing over here, uh, I need to be able to supply test vectors. It's worth mentioning also that there are some more compact programmers that I can use uh, that, that aren't as enormous as this one, but this one from BP Microsystems is very high quality. It does things like measure like, hey, is the part drawing too much power? If so, do an emergency shutdown. And this is really useful because we're, you know, we might do things like, you know, short signals together internal to the IC. This is gonna save our bacon if, uh, you know, uh, we do some oopsie and uh, it, it won't destroy the chip, which might happen if we used a lower end programmer. So just a side note there. Um, but normally you'd stick this chip in a socket over here. I basically just put an extension cable on the socket. All right, uh, with that in mind, I did an oopsie. <laughs> I got a little bit aggressive before I started trying to actually put some of the oscilloscope on to collect better data. I thought that maybe I could just get away with putting some current limited like five volt, zero volt signal, and maybe the security would just would just bypass and I'd be done. Um, but this actually blew up the, uh, the, the little micro probes, which was quite surprising to me because uh, they're actually made of tungsten. I didn't get a good shot of this, but there was like a chunk of, of needle just sticking out of the die that had been like welded on and it fell off before I got a pic good picture. Yeah, just sprayed stuff everywhere and, and this didn't quite work. Um, but uh, fortunately, this was just a test chip, and so plenty of replacements. Uh, here, here is what more proper probing looks like. So you're going to see me putting a needle down. This is the one that we just cut that hole in, and uh, you see it just got lowered down. You see a little bit of shadow, and then as I apply pressure, you know it. You can see a little bit better the needle over here, and that's what it's supposed to look like. None of this explosion on contact stuff, which unfortunately I didn't get a video of, but was quite entertaining. All right, moving on. Um, we put this on this, uh, we, I should say we, uh, there's a fellow at this point who's helping a little bit named uh, Ethan Wright, uh, who's helping me collect a little bit of data here. And um, what happened then at this point was, uh, I was expecting during programming to see either like zero volts or five volts, 
but instead there was this kind of complex uh, square wave pattern. And this might have been related to why things kind of blew up before is because I was expecting just constant voltage. So I tried to uh, supply constant voltage, uh, but we're actually seeing this drive waveform. And um, I saw different levels depending on the side you were at. Uh, I tried to do some things like putting maybe 12 volts on one side, maybe, maybe I didn't put enough power or the right. I tried a few things, nothing was really working. So at long last, I said, you know what, let's just take the simple approach. And um, again, here you can see some, some uh, when I tried to put power in, it just, the programmer just flipped out. Um, yeah, so the simple approach is, you know what, I've got two micro probes, let's just put them both down and uh, we'll just short it externally. And there was this theory, although there's two security fuses that each fuse secured half of the data. And uh, lo and behold, this worked. So this, uh, this bit of text at the right that you're probably straining your eyes to take a look at, um, that's showing that I had put just a counting pattern as a, as a test part inside here. And uh, that just uh, shows that the, the top became unprotected when we did this and I was able to read it out. The bottom half is, is still protected, but all we need to do then is just microprobe half of the device uh, read out the memory, and then we can go to the other side of the device and uh, repeat the process, combine the two programming files, and then we get the full firmware out of the device. And this is ultimately how the project was completed, because this was a very, like, it produces the original, uh, I don't know, bitstream JED file for the device. We got all of the data. It was relatively quick to do this, and so it had a lot of nice properties. As long as you have that laser probe station in your in your bedroom, basically, which uh, well I do, but your mileage your mileage may uh, vary there. Uh, but using the tools you have available, um, I think we have we're almost out of time. I'm just going to gloss over this real quick. You um, have ten or, minutes more, so don't worry. Yeah, when, it's time. I'll, I'll just gloss over this because at least leave some uh, time for questions. Was that? You're on mute. I'm on mute. Um, John, we cannot um, hear you. Okay. I, I, I can hear John. Can you, you can hear me? Hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear John. Maybe, yeah, maybe, that's, it. maybe that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if I can get back to there then. I was just saying you have 10 minutes almost, so don't worry. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me just go over this, this briefly. Um, so in the last... Uh, infrared talk, I mentioned that I was looking at higher sensitivity cameras. I found this fancy in-gas camera, which is a very sensitive to infrared light, uh, but it, um, it basically has such short exposure time due to some practical kind of industry uh, standards that it wasn't really that useful. Like I could do like 50 milliseconds max exposure and I need a lot longer to do practical things. Uh, by comparison, some of the shots I used in a previous talk were 15 seconds long. Uh, with, with a more off-the-shelf camera. So huge gap there, and the better sensitivity of this camera didn't outweigh the low exposure time. Um, I also was able to get a camera on loan from a friend uh, from uh, one Tesla, and uh, this is basically like a, a cooled camera that goes to negative 70 degrees centigrade. And although it's not as sensitive as the previous camera, I can I get such low noise and I can do such long exposures that it really opened up a lot of possibilities. I mounted this on a uh, kind of a low cost CNC machines. I think these things are called like 3081s or something like that. Like you find them on Amazon. It's like a very common type of CNC machine. Uh, due to the sheer size of this camera, which I'm not sure is entirely apparent or not uh, in these images though, like here's a motor for comparison and you can see part of the camera here. So it's, it's quite physically large. Uh, I did have to use a heavier duty version of this with kind of an aluminum frame, uh, which is on the high end of these. But anyways, mounted all of this in a nice enclosure and uh, started running a few other experiments. Uh, notably here, for example, I was programming some EEPROM and I could actually see the, the EEPROM being selected as it was being programmed. So here on the right, for example, we have a partial exposure where it didn't finish programming yet, and, uh, but you can see the memory it's cycling through. So I was hoping to try to uh, extend this to take a look at like some security fuses that were EEPROM based to see if those would just pop right out and um, more or less ran out of time there, although that would not be hard to, to do this additional step. I had some chips that were decapped and they basically had died during storage. So I uh, needed to get some new chips to test with. 
Um, I also would really like to take a look at some things like anti-fuses. You know, for example, uh, I've had a lot of people who are interested in uh, preserving some firmware for these Actel FPGAs. And uh, I think this technique might be really valuable to, to locate those fuses. And the other thing is, especially if I find a few parts that I need to connect a lot of things on, instead of using uh, micro probes, I want to explore some, I'm going to call low cost fib edits, where I can do things like maybe use a sputter coder or a silver epoxy to start bridging connections together. Um, so hopefully you get some research there in the near future. Uh, with that, I want to give some special thanks to Ethan Wright who helped uh, with some of the lab work at the end there, as, as previously mentioned. Uh, Bailey for lending me that camera that allowed me to do some of those uh, EEPROM uh, emission tests and stuff like that. And finally, Brandon Cobb, who was the original uh, inspiration for this project. Uh, he's interested in track stars and uh, funded uh, some of the samples and stuff for this project. Um, so with that, uh, thanks for listening. Here's a few links to a few of the projects here. And uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions and hope you enjoyed. All right. All right. Thanks, John. That was amazing detailed presentation. Uh, I, friends, do you have any questions? Please send them across via the chat uh, because the next session is going to be the breakout room with the sponsor and the coffee break. So we have almost five to 10 minutes. We can take questions with John over here. Uh, John, there's one question. Let me read it out for you. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your process for decapsulation, and how do you photograph the dyes? Uh, how do I decap and photograph the chips? Well, uh, it depends on the type of chip. The most common are epoxy chip. Uh, I start by buying the sketchiest nitric acid that I could find online, and then that shows up. Uh, and, then, and then from there, uh, is this a fuming nitric acid? Uh, I use that on a hot plate uh, to take off the layers of epoxy, and that exposes the chip, and you have to do very short exposures, uh, otherwise the nitric acid will also damage the chip. And then I take a microscope, which I specially modified with some uh, motors so that I could pan it around and get high resolution images. And uh, yeah, that's able to take a lot of photographs, stitch it together with uh, Huggin, basically, using modified tools and uh, then use programs like say ROMPAR if, if I want to actually get the bits off of it uh, after that. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. I direct you to siliconpron.org. I think I've got a little t-shirt on uh, if, you, if you want some more uh, information on decapping and whatnot. So. All yep, right, yep, yep, yep. friends, any more questions for John? Let's give them a minute. Yeah, sure, there's another one. Uh, here we go. Um, yeah, can you please give some more details about the laser setup uh, used to expose the metal before probing? Yeah, that's actually a whole tangent for me. Uh, that's something called a uh, easy laser, and uh, the story there is it's something called an ND YAG laser. Uh, basically, a flash lamp puts a massive amount of energy into a laser rod. Something called a Q switch uh, basically is like an optical transistor. And it just shoots out a massive blast of energy. And I have some special shutters that allow me to tune the, the output power as well as the size of the beam. And uh, I basically practice on an area of the chip that's non-critical first, or ideally a test chip as well. And I basically gradually increase the energy output from this laser until it just blasts through uh, the chip without damaging it. And um, uh, yeah, that's kind of the high level overview. Um, it mounts to typically a Minotoyo microscope. You theoretically could mount it to a different microscope, but it might blow holes through your optics. So, you know, just be a little bit careful there. I think this was very carefully designed so that it never focused too much on your microscope and just kind of blew it up. Um, don't know if that answers your question. Hopefully that gives you a little, little more detail. Uh, what is the smallest feature size you have experimented with? I would probably say that for microprobing, at least, if that's your question, that I'm limited to about one micrometer just based on a lot of the equipment I have. It kind of tops out around there. That's both the micro positioners I have, uh, the laser. Um, in terms of reverse engineering chips, uh, I actually just got a much more powerful scanning electron microscope. Traditionally, I was limited by my optical microscope that could do, I'm going to call it 150 nanometer resolution. But even if you can resolve to that power, it's quite ugly. You, you really want something better. 
my old electron microscope was 30 nanometers, which is a lot better, but still not quite good. The new electron microscope is three nanometer resolution. And because, you know, uh, for, for image densities, both X and Y, you have kind of a squared relationship with resolution increase. So even the old sun, which was 30 nanometers to the new one, which is three, you're talking about a hundred times increase in image detail that I'm effectively gonna get by this new setup. Uh, so anyways, hope that answers that question. Uh, I think we're about out of time here, um, unless there's something can, else to add. We can take one last question from anybody who would like to talk uh, to John. All right. Well, you can always uh, hit me up on Twitter if you uh, if you want to chat with me. Uh, I think there's uh, no breakout session, I think is what I uh, There is no breakout session for this talk because we have the coffee break and the breakout room with uh, NVIDIA. But maybe, John, you want to join that breakout room and talk uh, over there with some sure. uh, the how, NVIDIA how guys. Do I, how, do I, yeah. So, yeah, how do I get to the breakout room? Yeah. Uh, so... Let me announce it, uh, how yeah, okay. we go about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and hopefully, uh, John, you could also bring your uh, bomb disposal army uh, in the breakout room to share it with everybody if you have it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it was amazing to have you again. At